If you love classic contemporary Christian music and the people that made it, please like this video and subscribe to our channel to help support us and keep us going. This is Stage Right, and I am your host, John Thorne. They say if you die with a handful of friends, you die a rich man. Well, I have several buses full, and I'm very excited to share them all with you. Welcome to Stage Right. I am your host, John Thorne. This is episode 20. My guest today is my really good friend, Mark Gershmill. In the last 30 years, I've probably done more projects and worked more with Gersh than any other one person. We've done um, records together. I've played on stuff he's produced. We've written songs. We wrote an amazing Christmas production with my brother-in-law, Scott Cruzen. Uh, we've spent a lot of time in the last 30 years having fun, doing music, writing songs, and uh, very honored to have him on the show today. He's a great producer. He's a wonderful keyboard player, a fantastic singer, and truly one of the most talented people I know. Uh, here's a list. I was going to give you a top five list of my favorite Mark Gershman songs, and then I thought, well, I need to do a top 10, and I couldn't even stop with 10. I go back to the very first White Heart album in terms of being a fan and listening to them and loving their music. So let me just rattle off some of my favorite Mark Gershman songs that he either wrote by himself or co-wrote with the other guys in White Heart. Let Your First Thought Be Love, Undercover, Vital Signs, We Are His Hands, How Many Times, 70 Times 7, Montana Sky, Sing Your Freedom, Let the Kingdom Come, over Me, Independence Day, Powerhouse, Desert Rose, Unchain, Light a Candle, You Can See the World from Here, Heaven of My Heart, Speak Softly, Find a Way, and I had to stop there just because I was running out of time. In addition to the crazy long list of hit songs he's written, he has a long list of things that he loves. He loves Indiana basketball, he loves Michigan football. He loves Perrier, LaCroix, his wife, Bryn, his son, Trevor, and new daughter-in-law, Danielle. And most of all, he loves the Lord. He'll be here right after this break. Hey, Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services to generate more leads, more exposure, and more revenue for your business or organization. Let Hey, Rockstar amplify your awesomeness. Ladies and gentlemen, pull your cars to the side of the road, get out and stand and cheer, jump up and down. He's battling through a winter storm warning, but he's with us today, my good friend Mark Gershmel. Dude, how are you doing today? I am well, not that I don't see any ice forming or trees or power lines. Yeah, that would be a little unnerving to live where you live and have an ice storm show up. Oh gosh! You know, I think I told you yesterday like, when they had that ice. That summer was two and a half weeks. There were so many trees down the road, uh, just all covering the road that they just couldn't get back here. Right. So they had to. Um, and I remember I was living over, the, you know, over in Coronada, and I, uh, Old Hickory wasn't really done, and so I ran over. Uh, I could, you could run from Old Hickory <laughs> over to Warner Park. Literally. So I, because there was nobody on the road. So I went over there and I went in Warner Park. And I honestly wept as when I was in there because there were all, you know, my usual running paths. There were so many trees down. You had just, you couldn't run. <laughs> there were just so many trees down. <laughs> so, especially when you got this giant oak above our house. I mean, it's huge. Right. And I, I've always had that. I've always had a little bit of a fear, to be honest with you, <laughs> that it was going to bisect the house at some point in time. But Well, you have uh, trees. You are literally surrounded by trees, and you're on a hill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and then there's that. So if a tree falls on you, it's likely to take you all the way down to the bottom. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, Tumbleweed Connection by Elton John. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we get too far off the launch pad here, I just want to stop and say 
Dude, you were truly one of my favorite people <laughs> and one of my best friends ever. And I appreciate you taking the time to do this today. Well, right back at you, by the way. Um, uh, your beloved host, I will just get this, I'd say this right off the top. If you ever want to have an avalanche of ideas about, and it doesn't matter what the subject is, in the first 10 minutes, as, as my wife friend says, John Thorne will give you more creative ideas than any single person we know. I mean, it, it will be, get your pen ready because you're <laughs> going to miss a gem. <laughs> and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, yeah, I have loved you for so long, and I'm great, uh, grateful and honored that I can be part of this for you. Oh, dude. I'm telling you, man. We, we could literally do one podcast episode a week for a year and not cover everything e easily <laughs> like th this is not one of those situations where we we did a six-month tour together and then we went our separate ways and we had laughs and we had a good time and we can go back and reminisce i mean literally you and i spent years working together in white heart out of white heart and certainly as much since white heart ended yeah and that's uh that's what's what just deepens friendships for one thing, but you gain so much respect for one another. But it's but then the way our, our lives have wonderfully intertwined and now it's it's about all the kids, you know, and it's about right. it's the stories. It's, yeah, it was all about all the creation and the and the way that we were able to serve God and his people. That was that was at the core of all of it and remains at the core of all of it. But uh uh there was a lot of fun that was had along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of Thai food. More fun than what we should have been allowed. Yeah, it's probably not legal if you think about it. <laughs> well, <laughs> we had guardian angels that were kind of monitoring the situation. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> they asked for days off, but the Lord said no. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we can't leave these two alone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, That's right. <laughs> So normally I have about five or six pages of notes and we just flip through them and talk. But this time I think I'm just going to wing it. And I think we should start with your childhood, your early childhood and your musical influences. Well, I am a Northern Indiana boy and proud of it. I remain a Hoosier and uh, always will. I'm a Midwestern guy. I just, I, I love it here in Nashville where I live currently, but, uh, and, uh, I will remain a Hoosier, <laughs> right. but I grew up in a very musical household. My mother was a conservatory graduate on piano. My dad, uh, he, he actually had a singing group on the radio, four guys and a girl. He was a, he played a lot by ear and they both played pipe organ. And it, it just, there was always music in our house. And, uh, the, the storyline is from my mother was always that I started plunking away, picking, making tunes when I was three years old on the piano. And, they were probably horrible. <laughs> One of the coolest things about your story is tell everyone who your first piano teacher was. My mom. Isn't that the coolest thing? <laughs> and I, I went all the way up through college and I had wonderful teachers in college and they were not better than my mother. I just, uh, I just am amazed at just what a gift she had. And she taught into her eighties man, and there were so many people, even then, that students from the past uh, that just would send, like, Christmas, Christmas, the mailman had to get a separate truck just for the cards that came to her house, just because all her students would send her things. Because whether they, you know, they continued to play, what they always had with them was, was my mother was the best listener on the planet. Yes, she taught them amazingly well at piano. They were learning keyboard harmony, how to construct songs within the first two months, which is rare in a teacher. Right. But what she did, she was hands down the best listener I have ever met on the planet. So when people sat on our piano bench, they knew that the woman that was sitting next to them cared about every aspect of their lives. And that's what they remember the most. And you know what? That's what I remember the most about those times. Um, so that there's just no better way to learn. <laughs> well, but to be three years old and for a parent to hear a child pluck out some notes on a piano and then be able to sit there and like guide them. It wasn't like you only got 30 minutes a week with a teacher. You had your mom in the house. Yep. That is, that is ab, you're completely right. And, 
Um, and my dad, one of his many genius things, he, he built us a stereo because we didn't really have a good record player. <laughs> you know, it just he built our house. He'd never filled even a bookcase. He was just a in, very talented, interesting guy. But there, that boy, that w- record player was worn out. There, it was a needle a month club because <laughs> it was just, it was crazy how much music was going on, and it was all intertwined with. I, I grew up with the Lutheran Church, which had this remarkable choral tradition. That and my my godfather was the organist and choir master at the church, so there was that part of the connection too, and and just to be able to hear all that glorious music all the time and be part of that, and right. and and then I picked up, uh, I got fascinated with the trombone. <laughs> now, how 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 did that come about? Well, you know what, when I, when I was in grade school, I. Uh, I started on baritone, which is basically the same mouthpiece as a trombone. looks like a little tuba for those who don't know what a baritone is. Uh, it's a wonderful instrument, but limited in what it eventually can do. But there was a guy who played at church on Easter Sundays and the Christmas. Uh, his name was Ed King. He was six years older than me, and he was a wonderful trombone player and a wonderful person. Hmm. And I was so inspired by him. I said, I want to play trombone. And so... Uh, my sister had a friend from college who uh, had like a $5 trombone that she had gotten when she played in high school. And she gave it to me. And uh, literally within two and a half months after that, I got a call from guys that were in my high school. They were like two and a half and three years older. They had a band and they wanted me to be part of it. So when I was 15 years old, I was already playing for wedding reception and uh, in in bars, which is, you know, not the greatest thing, but it's a wonderful place to learn how to play. Boy, you learn what a rhythm section is all about. And right. these guys were really good. I mean, one of the guys, Steve Wiedenhofer, became the – he was the uh, dean of the School of Music at Millican College in, in Illinois. And, I mean, they were all wonderful players. I was just – and that is a theme – of my career, boy, I have been blessed to be around wonderful musicians. It just, right. it just, so that blossomed into, I ended up going to Ball State University and uh, playing a lot of trombone there. And I got a call. I, I don't even, I, I can't even recall how this happened, but there was a studio uh, about 25 minutes from Ball State where I was going to school and mm-hmm. they got my name somehow. I have no idea how, but I, <laughs> But I was still in college, and I was playing with these really, really good players. And they were doing all this Christian music, a lot of Christian music. And I found out that um, the studio was owned by somebody called the Gaithers. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, and coming from my Lutheran tradition, I literally had no idea who they were. Wow. And I never met them, right. but I just kept playing over there. And... But then farther down the road, I, I graduated. I was always playing um, in the summers up in northern Michigan, which is remains one of some of my favorite memories. I was playing keyboards and and trombone up in bands I put together up there. And Charlevoix. Yeah. Oh, man. Charlevoix, Michigan. I think God vacations there. He does. <laughs> it's just unbelievable. But then I was, after that stint one summer ended, I was um, I was up in... I was helping out another band. It was in Bloomington, Minnesota, outside of Minneapolis. And for the third time, they had called from this Gaither organization. They wanted me to audition. And I I don't, I guess that they sensed that, I don't know how it came up in conversations. I was a a believer or whatever, but they wanted me to try out. And there were just some things going on back in, back in Indiana that I felt like I needed to be home for. And, uh, so I went and I auditioned and, uh, was gratefully got got the job and then literally uh two days later we was playing before thirteen thousand people on Roanoke, Virginia and Hershey, <laughs> Pennsylvania and, right. and that's how I learned who the Gaithers were. <laughs> oh, that is awesome, dude. Now let me stop you for a second and tell everyone that back when you were learning to play trombone and going to Ball State and all of that, it's not like it is now where you listen to pop music and you you try to imagine where a trombone would fit. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> I don't even know the names of these people, but I don't I doubt Post Malone has a trombone in his repertoire. No, there's there, there's not a lot of that going on. <laughs> but back then, 
You had Chicago. You had oh, what yeah. other groups did you listen? I mean, is Motown that had horns all over the place? Oh gosh, yes. There were just tremendous the players that that backed up on the you know that whole Phil Ramone uh, wall of sound stuff that he did. There were horns involved with all of that. That you know one of the quintessential designers of of that whole town uh, Motown music experience. Just the but but yeah, Chicago. My my band played so many. We played the second album, the whole was the third side or something we played the whole uh the color of my loves uh, uh color of my world yes we, we played that whole thing it was 19 minutes long if i remember right um but then you know tower of power and uh, blood sweat and tears oh and yeah those guys were stud musicians too and and the guy in chicago was a great player who eventually went on to um los angeles and for for years a fixture in in all the recording industry stuff out there he's just he's a he's a great player so right. having to learn to play those parts and that's a, that's a wonderful thing for for all of us is how can you learn to play an instrument well well f play what great people play absolutely that was it was just a marvelous instruction period and you know and eventually you know it's with the with the gaithers it was it was just wonderful because here are these people who I did, I got to learn slowly. Right. And we were all just playing arenas, just huge, you know, huge halls on the weekends and, and they're the real deal. Right. I mean, they are exactly as advertised. Um, they're, they're just down to earth people. Very, very bright, mm -hmm. very, very committed to the Lord. Very, very committed to their, to the people that they're trying to serve. But what, what I saw then, and it was just with some of the difficult things that were going on in, in a, a very wonderful family that I grew up in, just so grateful for it. But, you know, hard things can happen to, to really good people. Right. I just thought part of my reasoning behind all this was I just want to see if these people are, are, the, are, are what they're cracked up to be. <laughs> right. And, right. And they absolutely were. Yeah. And uh, without knowing they were ministering to the trombone player for a very long time. Wow. What I saw was here's these, these giant arenas and people would walk in and we'd, we'd play and they'd tell stories and read from the word. And two and a half hours later, the faces of those people were different. Right. They walked out full of the spirit of the Lord and happier. Right. <laughs> you know, more aware of the beauty of their own lives. And, and so that's when, I, I just, I, I really became committed to what Christian music could be. Uh, and uh, they, well, then a keyboard opening uh, became available and I auditioned for that and was uh, fortunate enough to get that. Right. And so I, I made the shift at that point in time because of exactly what you were describing earlier. There were so many hordes in music. Uh, for a long time, but it was starting to change. <laughs> <laughs> it's starting to change, all right. Okay, before we move on from the Gaithers, I wanted to get to songwriting with you a little later on, but before we leave the Gaithers, tell everyone the impact that working with Gloria Gaither had on you as a lyricist. Well, I, and I think that, uh, and I'm so grateful you brought that up, because here... Um, it wasn't, you know, I was listening to very different music at the time. and it, But when I would sit down and play these songs and I would listen intently to what they were saying, not only the construction, the beauty of the simplicity of a lot of those songs, but w what they were saying many times was anything but simple, but remarkably said. Right. And I became a fan. I, d I was just a fan of their writing. And so when I finally became just... It, God did some amazing things in our family and in my life to the point where I just realized I want to, I want to use my gifts. And I, I used to write things. I just throw stuff in the corner and I never, ever pursued it, believed in it, you know, whether it was a jazz head or a rock song or, or just singer songwriter kind of songs. I, 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 I just never did anything with them. But when I was so convinced of the Lordship of Jesus I wanted to do something for him. And I thought, well, I'm looking at two of the best people in the world at that. And so one, one weekend, I very tentatively, <laughs> very tentatively, um, uh, covered my eyes and handed lyrics 
to glory. I said, hey, I've been writing these things and would you mind looking at them? And, uh, you know, and I got to tell you, just there were hundreds of people who did that to her. Right. You know, and, and would come up to them after the concerts and want them to hear their songs or whatever. And and so, I mean, I was sheepishly doing this. Wouldn't you know, the next week we come out and she hands back my stuff to me. And it's there are there are red uh, red pen marks in the margins and mm. and um, and it's because like the teacher she was and she was so supportive and so uplifting about it. But she would say things like, now this is a great idea. And I love this line. And she sat down and talked with me about all this. Mm -hmm. I love this line, but can you see how it's really, really its own song? It's really its own idea. It's, I don't know that it necessarily fits here where she could have just said, you lunatic. Right. (laughs) (laughs) This is no place where you are scattered, man. Right. (laughs) But I learned about the 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 beauty of of taking an idea and letting it blossom between the brackets of rhymes and and to be able to tell stories in meaningful ways that, that touch the heart of somebody else and which is what they were always and remain great at doing. Right. And that investment in me, I will never ever forget it because it's and to anybody that's out there, and I, I just. I always feel like if somebody was that kind to me, right. I have an obligation. If there's anything, any way that I can to help them, I want to do that just because the, the legacy of song needs to pass on. We had a, a song that you were played many times, uh, The Flame Passes On. It was just about martyrs, you know, the, the, the hand-to-hand of history, you know, people get, that gave, literally gave their lives for the message of the Lord. And, and that's why I know about him now. And I believe that we as musicians and songwriters as a community of believers, owe that to the next generation, owe that to our Lord, right. To take those things and to pass those on the best of what we have to equip them to be the best of what they can be. Absolutely. That was the amazing thing about being in the Gaithers too, is they attracted great musicians yeah and of course you know it would be an honor to play for them and certainly a cherished gig for so many people to be if you played your instrument well that you could be part of what they were doing right and so yes that was that was a big deal but at the same time you know um bill those people are it takes a certain amount of selflessness to surround yourself yeah they're going to make you sound better but there's always somebody that could be, you know, a competition. He never, th- he never thought that way. Right. He helped so many people. I mean, I mean, there are just his legacy is not only the greatness of the songs that he and Gloria wrote and the work that they did, but it's it's equipping all these people to do what they did, and it didn't have to be what he did. Right. That was the amazing thing. I'm, he loved Billy Joel singer songwriter stuff. I mean, if you poured yourself out that way. He, I remember to this day, there was some guy he brought in backstage. Mark, Mark, Mark you, know, you always had that little stutter it's right. when he got excited, <laughs> which I love. When he got excited, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, but he said, I want you to listen to this guy's song. And, it, and he wasn't a Christian artist. It was some guy in, I don't even remember what town we were in, um, but he was from Nashville. And he, was, he, he had this song. It was about a love affair that one set, went wrong but it was the battle of the blue and gray or some title like that but it was a southern girl and a northern guy i think oh, it was wow. and it was a brilliantly written song and i don't I, I wish i knew that guy's name uh just to see where he ended up right. but it was that it was that fascination with the craft you right. know that was was so great so when you look up across the stage of the gauges at the time that i was in the band you know there were there were people that five of the f- original six members of Whiteheart were on stage at that time, along <laughs> with Sandy Patty. Right. And, you know, then Don Francisco, who wrote that huge song, He's Alive, he would be one of the opening acts, or Amy Grant was part of the opening acts, or Carmen was one of the right. opening acts in the middle. I mean, there were always people that that just did what they did extremely well. And so 
Whiteheart um, became formed out of that time. I mean, we just the the original five there were Dan Huff, um, who many of your listeners might know, who <laughs> went on to become one of the <laughs> quite honestly the greatest guitar players in the world and produce massive artists, absolutely uh, like Keith Urban and Carrie Underwood and. Dan actually played on Michael Jackson's bad record. Yep. <laughs> I mean, amazing, amazing musicians. And, and well, Steve Green was in that band. Um, yep. Gary Lund, who's playing, currently playing for Dolly, Dolly Parton and yep. did a lot, a lot of programming and things in the industry. And, uh, and Billy Smiley, who was in that band as well. I mean, we, 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 we got to, and Gaither would always tell the story about how we do, we do sound check and then we'd go out because we're in the arena. What rock band doesn't want to hear their song in an arena? Right. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> so we would just kind of cut loose and he's got this chuckle and it's like, man, those are my boys. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me just say this about Bill Gaither. I want to do the same thing I did with the trombone situation people can see gaither on videos now and they got the choir and everybody's the southern gospel that a boy you know that kind of thing but gaither 40 years ago was pop music in the church oh absolutely i mean it's hard for people to hear him now it's like my wife she listens to the beatles and doesn't think they're a rock band <laughs> because they don't sound rock compared to everything that's come after that yeah, it's 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 amazing. You you hit the nail on the head, and because you have probably one of the most informed understandings of of worship music. And by the way, once again, your listeners, if it, it, the guy you are who is hosting your show <laughs> is is a remarkable worshiper. He gets he gets what it is to worship. <laughs> um, uh, but yes, they were they were like pop songs, and and. With his with one foot in hymnody and the other foot in Paul Simon. Yeah, you know it's it was amazing how they they brought the stories of of real people to life. And those, so many of those songs were based on on relationships in real life. And and they were courageous. Yeah, uh, to be doing that at the time. Uh, and and boy, did the Lord not bless it because. I, Obviously, he wanted his people to hear those things, and yeah, they were they were amazingly uh, creative and courageous for the times, and and the volume of the work and the quality of the work. Yeah, I mean, uh, it it just goes on and on. I mean, I could I still have pictures in my mind of him telling stories about where those songs came from and being up there leaning on the piano, and it, there's. Some of the most beautiful memories I have of my entire music career, just uh, yeah, because then you realize that the lifeblood of great songs comes from the heart of great people. Wow, man, that's well said, dude. Very well put. Okay, so you are one of my all-time favorite songwriters, going back to the early White Heart stuff when I first heard you. Well, I appreciate you. You're very kind. Tell everyone what you think it takes to make a great song. Well, I think that there's there's a um, I, I I have found in my life the songs that I needed the most myself were the songs that people liked the most, loved the most, needed themselves, and and I think that great art is born out of that grand collision of your gifts and the moments of your life, and sometimes that may be a joyful experience, sometimes it may be a painful experience. But you you do those battles or you, you do that that love embrace or whatever it is in your mind and in your heart. And sometimes it wakes you up at 3.30 in the morning, you know, or it's, or it's grieving over a friend who's in a difficult place. Uh, there's this song I wrote, um, uh, Breakdown, years ago that was one of those songs that somebody I, about somebody who I dearly love. You know, those are the things you – you wrestle with those. And I believe that God has given us the chance to work out our faith in a song. I think that's why he allowed this tremendous gift of creativity mm -hmm. for all of us. And and sometimes you pull those songs burning out of your body. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it, it can be, it can happen. I do a lot of writing when I run now. I mean, I can come, 
I'll be out running and I'll come back and a song will be literally 75% done. Right. And sometimes I sit at the piano to try to hear what, play what I heard in my head, thought this is garbage <laughs> 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 or, but there are many times that it's just, uh, being out in nature. I, uh, I just, uh, he speaks to me. It gets simpler, you know, right. I do some listening and, and uh, so to me, that, that the process of songwriting is, is an echo of what it must have been like for God to create the world. I, hmm. To me, and anybody that's created anything, I'll, be, I'll bet if, you know, if you're a woodworker, if you're a, a musician, you just played a great part, or you've, you've made a masterful dinner, or, you've, or uh, nobody could believe the quilt you made. There is what I call the April rain experience. When you're through with it, there's this this freshness inside your heart hmm. that that is it's 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 a beautiful kind of clarity, and it almost it almost feels like well, yeah I was a part of this, but there's something so much bigger. It's just this beautiful clean feeling, and it's to me, it's just a small window of into God's heart what it must have been like to create the world. Oh wow, what a picture. And I and, and I'm just so glad he gives us that clue because first of all, we realize, yes, we were able to do something like this, and he equipped us to do this, and he wants us to use it. He didn't breathe life into us to not use the gifts he's given us. Right. No. But at the same time, it's it's when you realize then where the flow, the enormous, beautiful flow of creativity comes from, then you get to give it back. Yeah. You get to give it to the Lord, it blesses him and it blesses people. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, and I know you've, you've heard this because you were in the interviews and you were always so great in interviews, man. <laughs> I just knew I was going to crack up. At some point. <laughs> uh, but the same thing, you're so deep, you have so much wisdom. Uh, but, but, you know, it's when people would say to us, and you heard it many times, it's like, is it really limiting that, you know, that you're in Christian communities? People, you find it limiting? And I say, is God, you know, yeah. If if you believe that Jesus is the Lord of your life, what can't you talk about? Right. I know. The only thing that would limit it is uh, maybe somebody in their theology coming up and want to debate your songs or the number eight on your album covers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that was a good one. Oh, my gosh. Uh, oh. Yeah. To explain your listeners was the powerhouse record had a guy who was in bowling shoes on he was bowling and he had the number eight on his shoes and they said well that was one more than the perfect number and obviously we were saying something and it's like no actually uh the art director for that record um got that picture from a company in toronto canada <laughs> <laughs> we never saw it until it was there <laughs> oh dude that is too funny so come on christians don't read so much into things don't give the devil so much credit yeah. <laughs> so you take these songs that you write and you go in as a band to the studio. Tell everyone what the process is, what it's like to take these songs that have your heart and soul and you throw them out to the world via a canvas that's an album or a CD. Tell everyone what, in your words, that process is like for you. Well, and and you were part of this, so you can attest to it. Well, yeah, but I want to hear your take. <laughs> I want to hear your version. <laughs> well, when we would start a record, especially in the later years, we would come over to my apartment before we'd start up a record. Yeah. And even though we'd been together a lot, mm -hmm. it's it's important to collect your, your the moments of your life. And we've been on tour doing the last records and whatever, and, but it's time for something new. And so we would come over to my apartment and everybody would bring their books and, and, the, and we'd say, so what's been on your mind? What has the Lord been teaching you? What, what do you see in the world? What do you have, what do you have to say this time around? Right. And I would have my, uh, uh, n n my steno pad. I always wrote on steno pad, which is the stupidest thing. Because <laughs> you keep flopping the page back. The, the steno pad is a pad that's with a, with a, with a spiral bound on the top. Right. So you never know from left to right <laughs> where, where you're writing stuff, which which probably is why if anybody looked at my writing tablets, which I have a ton of them still. Cool. Um, in fact, there was a friend that came and visited, and it, it, I was looking for something. I said, "Oh, look at this!" And I said, "This is this is how I." He wanted to know how I wrote things, so I, and I turned it over, and I said, "Well, 
Okay, those were the first scratchings of the of the Freedom song, oh, man. which which was one of his favorite ever. <laughs> and so, but uh, but but look, it looks like the deranged uh, ramblings of a virtually insane man <laughs> <laughs> looking for freedom. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, we would sit in that room and you, you can attest to this once again, because you were there. And then I would write those things down. Like somebody would have an idea and I'd always put the attribution to the side of whose idea it was in case somebody in the band was able to write. And we were, as, as you know, everybody was, everyone was free to write. Everyone was free to bring in whatever idea they had. Right. We were going to try to get to the best songs, the best consensus of an experience and so we would write those down and, and, and put somebody's name by it. So we would always be able to attribute, you know, that somebody would keep their intellectual property for one thing. Right. But then we wanted the person to be that had that experience to be the biggest part of the idea. And this is the beauty of the time that you and I grew up listening to music, you know, back in the days when album covers were huge and the album covers told a story. Yes. But, but, and then there were cassette tapes. It was almost like, well, there's the interruption it could be an interruption or it could be an opportunity. You have five songs that fit together uniquely that way, or do you, or there is a, does the flip side that they fit together? But what all those 10 songs were was a voyage through life at that time. Right. And so rather than a 99 cent download or a dollar 29 cent download or whatever, or your playlist that Spotify is scattering about, you know, the, the cyber universe and, and making musical choices for us. And, you know, there's a lot of that, that I, I mean, I listen to new music every day. So I'm, not, I'm, I, I'm grateful for some of that technology. What I miss greatly is the intersection of an artist with their own lives and the times in which they live. And furthermore, the intersection with the actual artists, those yeah. songs were born out of my living room into a practice room into late night writing sessions, into like on the Freedom album, out, out at Montgomery Bell State Park with Brown Bannister and woodshedding those things for a day, you know, for all day long, for a week and a half to two weeks, and then going to NCS to rehearse. And, you know, it's, it's you know, it's Richie Biggs, who is an enormous <laughs> part of my musical life and heritage, or the engineer on a bunch of White Heart things and engineer on the road for white heart he yeah. says, good music is hard mm -hmm. you know to make great music is hard you got to work at it yeah and and he <laughs> was tremendous it remains tremendous at doing just that he's an engineer with an artist's heart yeah. but you you work on all those things and here you got these guys that are in the in the band and they bring in he just set the stage and they bring in who they are and just be prepared to be astonished because when guys come in like a Gordon Kennedy, you know, Chris McHugh or a Tommy Sims, good night, you know, I mean, yeah. but it goes on and on throughout the history of the band, you know, you're a Brian Wooten crunch guitar sound. Yeah. And so it's, you know, John Knox, the stuff that happens between the notes, the lyricalness of Anthony Sully. I mean, on and on and on and on these guys. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you've got some of the best sense of time I have ever heard. Uh, you know, to the bottom end coming out of your fingers. <laughs> I mean, just, and you get people that are pouring themselves into these parts and then you've got Rick Florian singing it. Right. Are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, what a gift it is to be able to write a song and have that voice sing it. Oh, I know. I know. There were times, dude, when I just wanted to look at Rick and say, do you know how good your voice is or are you just out here clowning around? Well, and... I don't, and you know him so well. I don't think he does know. I don't. I mean, I think he feels pretty secure, and obviously that he was a pretty good singer. Yeah. He has no idea how good he really is. I don't think he does. <laughs> well, and as Gordon Kennedy, who is playing for Garth Brooks now and played for Peter Frampton and many other people throughout his career, uh, he says, Rick's the best front man I've ever seen. Yep. <laughs> he is. And... I, I just, I remember so clearly, I, um, I don't know if you were on this gig or not. It was, we were playing in, uh, it was an outdoor park mm -hmm. in Kansas City. Worlds of fun. And it, a thunderstorm came through. It was 96 degrees. And a thunderstorm came through and it was violent. Yeah. I mean, it was a violent storm. And, 
after it passed through, uh, and we're already two hours late on whether we were going to play, they said, yeah, we want you to play. Well, it was a concrete uh, band shell, and there was water in the front, but they cleared enough of the water off the stage. It was actually safe not to be, to be fried publicly. Dude, I was there. It was worlds of fun in Kansas City. Oh, yeah. So so you, you remember this probably. So here there, uh, we were doing, um, it's hard was always in it where there's this big drum break and 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 rick would always do stuff that he didn't even remember doing right it was always engaging at that point and so he goes up the front the fans are great they've been out in the heat all day they sat through a thunderstorm they they want this they're 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 great crowd and he goes up front and there is this big puddle of water in the front and he's got his wireless (laughs) bike and he goes down he completely lays down on the ground he's singing his, his heart was always in it and it's going back and forth between the drums and the bass thing and he starts pounding on the this huge puddle of water right and the water is just flying everywhere <laughs> and it's going all over the crowd who could not possibly love it more right <laughs> You know, and, and so after it's just typical after after the show is over, and I said, Rick, that was so great that thing you did with the water in front. Wait, what? What did I do? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I always thought of Rick on stage as as a three year old in a sandbox. <laughs> 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 he just took whatever was there and just played with it. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that is so totally right, and. And the thing that remains so endearing about him is, is he, yes, he has no idea how good he was yep. or is, yep. and he's a very bright guy, but he is, um, in his own words, as a squirrel, squirrel, ADD as it comes. <laughs> H-D-A-D-D. Yeah. <laughs> but he is so humble. Yeah. And I think that the audience recognized that this is this is somebody who not who's approachable, yeah. but who cares about me? Yep. And I did an interview with him. Gosh, it's probably about a year ago. And he teared up massively in the middle of the, the interview because he just thought about. He said, "When I thought about all the people who save money to spend money to get their family there and whatever they were going through their life." And I and I had the opportunity to sing to them, and he's cheering up. Right. You know, it's just the privilege of be able to do that meant so much. Well, it meant so much to all of us, but right. you know, sp- specifically as it relates to him. You know, and I, if I'd give him my life force and and trust him with it. I mean, I, I'd give him a dollar. I'd give him a penny and trust him with it. Yeah. Is he's that kind of guy. Yeah, well, we know he doesn't spend his own money, so he's not going to spend oh, yours. Right. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I remember when he got his first house, we went over, and it's like, you guys want ice cream? He's like, yeah, it sounds great. And so he brings out this ice cream, and I go, Rick, are we having ice cream or soup? <laughs> said, well, I'm, I've been trying to find the magic temperature because I don't want to run the – I don't want to run the freezer too much. It's like, well, this is not the magic temperature. <laughs> but if you get some chocolate syrup, we can make chocolate milk. That's right. <laughs> that was Rick. He, the self-proclaimed Jack Benny of, of lead singing. Oh, my gosh. He did love Jack Benny. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot all about that. All right. So before uh, we get beyond this, since we're talking about, uh, we just talked about worlds of fun in Kansas City, and we're talking about gigs and 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 whatnot. Tell everyone about the trip that we took to South Africa and why we went. Oh, wow! <laughs> One of the best trips ever. Well, it was a historic event. Absolutely. And when you think about how you were privileged to to be the eyes on one of the most seminal moments in history of, of certainly the 20th century and echoes far past and beyond. Uh, so we were going to South Africa. We were going to play for what's called the Rand festival. And the Rand festival is the largest festival in South Africa. Yeah. They have two main TV stations. It was broadcast on those TV stations. They have two main radio stations that cover the entire country. FM one, I think it was FM one and FM two. And the Rand festival was carried on all that live and 
it's there. What were there a hundred thousand some people there? Yeah, it was huge at the actual site. Yeah, they said that it would be between one hundred and fifty and two hundred thousand people there at the site, and then whoever came to the concert. Yeah, it was it was it was a huge event, uh, their biggest public event yearly on their calendar. And we were going the very month that they were going to have their first f- free elections. Yep. So as we're getting to get on the plane to go down to Atlanta to pick up the uh, uh, South African Airways plane to cross the Indian Ocean, um, we pick up the USA Today. This is chaos in Johannesburg, 31 <laughs> yeah. dead. Well, guess where we're going. <laughs> I know, right? Tell everyone the historical event that had taken place not too long before the South African government invited us over. Well, uh, for years, there was that a, a repressive system of government called apartheid, where uh, even though the blacks were an enormous part of the population base of the country, they were not allowed to participate in this culture and in society and especially in government in, in any major way. That was about to be blown to pieces. Yep. And and so a lot of courageous people, Nelson Mandela being uh, the forefront of all that, had battled for years and and finally, this moment was going to open up. I remember us driving by. There was a, a poor slum area that had been famous in the news for years and years called Soweto. And we drove by Soweto, and it just broke my heart. Um, but it, it was a seminal moment. But there was so much fear yeah. about what that was going to mean when the reins of government were going to be handed over to the with the African National Congress, the ANC. And so we get on this 747 what were there 30 people on that plane yeah it was insane it was like an x-files it was so empty there was hardly anyone on it it was it was bizarre uh it's maybe 30 people and we're not joking right and so uh, when we get there um it was one wild thing after another uh starting with rick florian kneeling in the in the ground looking at a this is a South Rick Florin, the biology major in college, kneeling down saying, this is an African beetle. <laughs> Picking it up. <laughs> yes. Well, I read about these. It's like, great, Rick. <laughs> Are you sure you don't want to take some diseases home with you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so here we are, privileged to be, were, there, were we the only Christian group? There were a lot of secular. Yeah, we were the only Christian group. Uh, yeah, and what a privilege that was. And Earlier in the day, we had done, we did 30 minutes live on their national, um, on the FM station. Yep. And do you remember what I had to do after that? Let me remind me. I don't even know that you, you may not even have known this. Well, we played for 30 minutes and then these guys, the producers come out and the engineer come out from the sound booth and they come up to me and they said, so, um, you know, we, uh, we have a theme song for the radio station. <laughs> I remember that. It's like, okay. and so would you consider playing? And we just like to hear you play. We'd like to record you playing. It's like, okay. I mean, here's a song I don't know, right. but they want me to sing and play. And they've got a lead sheet, you know, chords and, uh, well, they actually had a written out parts, but then they also had one that was just chords and the actual notes. Right. And, and I'm looking, and it's like four pages long. <laughs> You know, three, you know, three and a half minute song, and it's like, okay, and you want me to do this when? Well, now, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay, that's right. Well, let me look at it. Give me, give me fifteen minutes. So I looked at it, and I kind of shrunk it down. I thought, well, you know what? I did not want to play three and a half minutes of music here, and but I, but I hear, I hear something in this that I really like. So I took a part of it that was supposed to be more up tempo, and I slowed it down, and made it more bluesy even under jazz a little bit mm-hmm. and it was just on an acoustic piano and uh so i ran it through one you know it said you know red light turn it on so i ran it through and played it and sang it and they they come out and they go that is great we love that that's going to be perfect for our late night stuff we can't thank you enough i go oh that's <laughs> that's good so you're going to use that oh yeah i said yeah we've only asked the only other people we asked were elton john and brian adams <laughs> And I, I, was, I was like, I am so glad that you didn't tell me that before I did. <laughs> because I would have frozen up. 
<laughs> well, the thing I remember about this is Capitol Records in L.A. is like a tower. It's like 25, 30 floors, and it's just a tube that goes up. Well, that's how the building was for the South African telecommunication system. The news, the radio stations and everything were all in this one building for the whole country. So if I remember right, we would do an interview on one floor and then go to another floor and play songs, and then you had to go to a different floor to do your recording. Yep, that was it. You know, and I've, I did sessions for years, so I'm uh, you know, kind of familiar with some of that, but not to play and sing at the same time. Sure. It's, it's one thing to play, and it's another thing to sing, but to do something that you're reading off of a chart that you've never done before. So it's just, you know, massaging it into a framework where it actually made some sense was part of it and just and so um anyway it was it was an honor to do it but i was like wow i'm so glad you didn't tell me that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay so i remember it this way correct me if i'm wrong but that night we did two concerts and the first one they filled up the soccer stadium and we did a run through we did a concert but the tech guys the tv guys for south african television they used it oh, yeah as a dress rehearsal to get ready for the main one. So then the second concert, they emptied out all the stadium and brought in a whole new crowd. And the second one is the one that aired on television. Yes, I do remember that. And I know you know why. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> yes, please do share. So the aforementioned, you know, we, we talked uh, a little bit. There's a, a song we had called The Flame Passes On. <laughs> It's in my notes, dude. You're reading my notes. <laughs> and Mark Miyagi, our wonderful, uh, Mark Mian, our wonderful lighting guy, comes up to me and he says, hey, th these, these, these guys are here from England and they're pyro guys. And I know you don't like pyro, which I don't like. I never liked pyro because even when I knew it was coming. Right. It freaked me out. <laughs> <laughs> the concussiveness of the sound, everything. I, I, it's obviously such a huge part of rock concerts, but it was, it always, even when I knew it was coming, it freaked me out. Right. So it's like, oh, he says, so I, I know you don't like pyro, but these guys are done it all over the world. They're the best. And they heard that song, Flame Passes On, in the first concert. They, they would like to do something. I said, oh, okay. <laughs> So the way the flame passes on, there's there's you know, first chorus, first chorus of the ghost, and the kind of half instrumental break where there's some some little uh, scat singing in the background. And my setup was always uh, I I had things in a, in an L shape, so I had two keyboards in the front, two board keyboards on my right hand side, mics on both, so I could sing at either part of the rig. Well, these guys had the thought that they were going to put in the very front, they were going to put a pyro bar. So these guys were, I mean, they actually were famous for all the world for doing pyro. They'd all over that. They were from England. And, and so I thought, well, best of the best in big, this is a big show. So I'll let them do, let them do their thing. Let them be creative, which is always, I always love when people do their things I can't do. So I thought, all right, so this time you can at least go, go with the role. So they decided they were going to put this bar of pyro in the front. They're like nozzles that shut out flame. And they, they rehearsed it, and it was like, wow, well, that, sheesh, that's cool. That's cool. I see why you want to do that. Flame passes on. And so. And there was flames all over the stage. It wasn't just in front of your keyboard. It's funny that I don't remember that. <laughs> I mean, there was pyro going off around the stage, but yes, you were the highlight. You were th well, the yeah, featured I artist. I was the lead singer on that song, <laughs> yes. so until the, until the chorus, and. And so, yeah, I was the featured person. I was the one scatting at that point in time. So a lot of the attention was was on my rig. So fast forward to the night after we did the afternoon show, and and it's uh, it's a it's a beautiful night, and uh, we get to that spot of the show, and well, what, what we discovered then is it might have been a beautiful night, but it was maybe a blustery night <laughs> because. Whatever, whatever the direction the wind was blowing during the rehearsal was not the wind direction it was blowing at night. <laughs> so we get to the break, and the next thing I know is this massive orange wall of flame that shoots up, and it starts drifting towards me. 
And I literally had to, it instantly shocked me, backed me up in the, it's almost like somebody hit me. Yep. It backed me up in the microphone. I'm supposed to be singing. I can't sing. I can't even get near my rig. <laughs> you know, dude, I was standing right next to you. I saw this. I had a front row. I was four feet from you. Your hand, you did not let go of the keyboard with your right hand. You were kneeling down behind your keyboard, ducking, trying to let the flames shoot over your head, but you didn't want to stop playing because you couldn't sing. So you're still playing and hanging in there like, I'm doing this for dear life. And I'll bet none of the 11 million people watching at home on TV could see you. <laughs> it was like, oh, my God, I think the keyboard player spontaneously combusted. <laughs> it's so funny to hear from your perspective because I don't think you've ever told me that before. Man, it was the funniest thing because you were trying to hang in there and do the show and be a pro. And it's on TV, South African television, all over the country. And you're still trying not to catch on fire. <laughs> Well, and the truth of the matter is, when it was over, my my arms were covered with soot. Yes. And it did singe some of my hair. Yes, and it left marks on your keyboard. Oh, it melted. You know, there's a famous thing about old Hammond B3s, is, it, it, is that if somebody had you know, had them planted in a bar, that you know they would lay their cigarette on the top key or the bottom key, and there would be melted marks on those keys. Yep. Seriously, it was a, it's a big joke about b3s yeah uh that was all over these keyboards yeah. <laughs> so the rest of the night i was playing in divots you yeah know, it was like trying to shoot a golf shot out of somebody else's bad shot <laughs> it was the best of times it was the worst of times <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny now here's something crazy there is a White Hart fan that listens to my podcast in Johannesburg, and I apologize for not having his name in front of me, but he knows who he is. He reached out to me a few weeks ago to tell me that he has a home recording, a VHS copy of the concert that the government broadcast of us in Johannesburg. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. No, I told him, I said, if there's any way he can get us a copy that we could play in the U.S., I would make copies and get them to everybody in the band. Oh, I would love that. Wouldn't that be sweet? If we could see the TV perspective of the flame passes on, dude, you would look like a NASCAR wipeout in turn three of the Daytona 500. <laughs> <laughs> I don't doubt that. Well, you, don't you remember how, how nice they were to us in yeah. South Africa? Everybody was so kind to us. Yeah, there were two people, though, that weren't nice, the guys that stole the banners. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> they climbed up the scaffolding. And took two thousand dollars. I forgot about that. <laughs> they took two thousand dollars worth of White Hart backdrops. Oh, that's I totally forgot about that. <laughs> the Highlands from the Highlands tour. Oh, absolutely. They were thirty feet long, ten feet wide. Yep. And some guy has them rolled up in his mom's basement somewhere. <laughs> yeah, their ethics weren't tied down. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they were not. So uh, the day after the concerts, they took us to the Mabula Lodge Game Reserve for a three-day safari. Oh, man. So did you go to dinner that very first night with Rick and I? It was our first night, and we were there early. We got to the cafeteria early. Were you with us? No, I didn't. Okay. So the first night, <laughs> we're walking to the cafeteria. We get up to the – we're walking around the building, and we see everybody in white coats up on chairs, and they've got mops and brooms and whatever they could <laughs> grab. And so as we walked around the building, it was obvious that there was something going on or literally something in the cafeteria. Something wasn't right. So we come around to the doorway that was you know, like a double wide doorway that was all open. The doors were pushed open. And a park ranger looked at us and said, hey, fellas, <laughs> we need you to wait outside. Um, we're running a little bit late for dinner tonight. And I said, well, what's going on? What you got <laughs> something in here? Is there something running around? And he said, well, kind of. But I just really need you to stay outside until we can resolve it. And then Rick's like, well, what is it? And he gets on his hands and knees, and he's trying to squat down and see it and everything. So the guy says, well, we have a spitting cobra. And I said, oh, my gosh, that's, like, really rare, isn't it? And he said, no, actually, it happens more than you would imagine. <laughs> and so I said, well, how in the world could this – how did the snake get in? Did it just come through the door? And he's like, no, it came in off a tree and came down the roof and into a window upstairs. Then it came down the steps – and into the kitchen because it was following the heat 
from the kitchen because it's the winter over in South Africa. And I was like, oh my gosh, no way. And I said, well, he's trying to catch it. Does, don't you have one of those harness things on a stick that you can put around its head and tighten up and lift the snake up and carry it out? Oh, and he's like, yeah, we used it last time we had one come in, but we can never seem to find it when we need it. And I said, oh my God, dude, you see that doorway right there? That would be the perfect place to hang it, right above that door. You would know where it's at all the time. So they were getting restless, and the, the park ranger said, you know, we're trying to catch this because it's a game reserve. We don't want to kill it. But... Yeah, I'd feel better if you just kill the steak. <laughs> I, I'm with you. <laughs> That's what I told him. So as it turns out, they ended up having to kill the snake after a while. Well, it was under our table, right? Yes. Where we ended up sitting. Yes. Yes, it was, Yeah. <laughs> So just the, it was just so crazy to me to think that this happens all the time and it's still happening. Can we fix this happening? <laughs> so anyways, the other thing about the Mabula Lodge, tell everyone we were there over Easter Sunday. Oh, yeah. Tell everyone um, the surprise that you were granted when you checked out. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah. Well, I am newly married. So my wife from California is spending her first Easter gloriously alone right. <laughs> in in Nashville, Tennessee. And of course I was missing her anyway. So I just said, you know, I'm gonna call her. I'm gonna call her on Easter and call her on Easter I did. And I talked to her for sixteen and a half minutes. Yep. And it was just over three hundred dollars. <laughs> I remember the shock and awe on your face when he said three hundred and fifteen dollars or whatever it was, and you looked you looked over at me like I only talk for sixteen minutes, <laughs> and I said, "Well, you know, we kind of are out in the middle of nowhere in Africa." <laughs> like I said, yeah, beautifully in the middle of nowhere in Africa. But holy, holy hoots, man! Yeah, that was a shock. Yeah, that was such a cool trip, though. Oh my gosh! Yeah, I, I know you remember just being out on those, on those. They would have these. What, what would you call? Like, you know, they, how would you describe? Them? They were like giant, giant jeeps that had stadium seating almost in them, um, like two and three rows of seating that would ascend. And the further back, every row was built up so you could see over everybody. Yeah, it was it was really cool. And so we're out there, literally in the middle of the, the just the dust in, of Africa. And it was, oh, you get, boy, one, you get the magic of Africa. It was, there's a magic to Africa. It was just, God, I, I'm just a firm believer that every place is, yeah. is beautiful in its own way and has, has, there's a reason why God put it there. But I'd never been to Africa. And it was just, it was just awe-inspiring. And to see those animals, you know, to see giraffes and to see hippopotamus and, they did have a lion, but they but they had it in a run just because that they could kill us. <laughs> I do remember they told us stay away from the ostriches, stay away from the water because of the hippos, and and of course they said stay in the jeep. So the first chance we had to hop out and go get pictures, we hopped out and ran towards these rhinos. And Anita, our driver, the reason I remember her name is because an unnamed member of our road crew was in love with her, <laughs> but, um, I won't even go down that road. <laughs> so Anita is screaming, get back in the Jeep, get back in the Jeep. And we're all like running through these trees. And then all of a sudden these rhinos catch our scent and they start doing rhino things. And <laughs> we got them like worked up. We go running back to the Jeep. We come, we go driving down a road and then we see this crossroad that, and, hey, go that way. It might get us closer to the rhinos. And you remember when we came through the clearing that one rhino tried to charge us? I do remember And tried that. to knock the Jeep over. Like, he literally this huge Jeep, and this rhino is, like, half as big as this Jeep. And he'd come at us. He was going to kill us. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. I think he knew we were the, we were the ones that had gotten out of the Jeep when we weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> I recognize those guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, anyways. Yeah. Boy, that that was a magical, magical trip for so many reasons, and th those are those were some of the perk privileges that you would never have ever dreamed that you would have been able been a part of. Yeah. And 
I'm so so grateful for all for all that. Man. Just for the the fact that the government wanted to bring us over to show not only racial unity but spiritual unity. Yeah, it was just the privilege of being able to be part of that, and we didn't change one thing we did for that night. No, we didn't. Oh my gosh! Before we go, dude, you have to tell everybody. Oh yeah. Do you remember they they were adamant about us not sharing the gospel over national television? Yep, I do remember that. So we timed the set out where the last song was going to be this song, and when it ends, the guy in the building in the room with the control button is going to flip a switch, and it's no longer being broadcast. After that point, you can share the gospel. You can share whatever you want. Well, that night, the guy that was supposed to flip the switch to cut off the broadcast after that last song was so captivated by what you were sharing (laughs) that he was listening and forgot to turn off the broadcast, and you shared the gospel, not only with the crowd, but with 11 million people over South African television. And as soon as you prayed and said, amen, he realized, oh my gosh, I've got to cut this off, I forgot, and he flipped the switch. And I'll never forget our, I guess, liaison from the government was a Christian, and she come running up after we walked off stage, and she's like, you guys are never gonna believe what happened. They forgot to flip the switch, so the gospel went out to 11 million people tonight. Just unbelievable. And it was you that shared it. Well, it's and that's just, that's the hand of God to do things that we can't, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, that that, that was a magic, you know, that truly, that's, it's not only a highlight of our time together in Whiteheart, it's just, it's just, those are highlights of your life. Right. I feel the exact same way, looking back on those things. It's just remarkable. The idea that God allowed us to be part of all of that is just, and that he orchestrated moments like that yeah. where we got, we got to share in what he was doing. Well, and the thing is, is I bet there's so many of your listeners that in their world and in their way, they probably have had moments like that right. in doing things. And you gather up those basket of treasures yes, and you hold them close mm-hmm. and you let them inform you. You know, James Joyce, the writer always talk, talked about these epiphanies in our life. Well, James, uh, the epiphany came a lot sooner, and yes, it was that burst of light, hmm. you know, and God does those things. He He allows us to have those moments uh, for each of us to say, this is your touchstone. This is this is, this is is something you need to remember always, and, and I'm going to bring it into your mind, maybe at a time when you're really down about yourself. I'm going to bring it back to you that you did something. Hmm. You were part of something that, that God allowed you to be right. and to use your gifts and to, and to celebrate not only, not only him, not only yourself, but, but life itself. Right. And, and those are the steering moments, you know, whatever those were, whether with your family or with your church or with your, you know, something you use, you were able to pour out of your hands at work or whatever. Right. You know, those, th- those things guide us and, and provide, you know, structure to the very moments of our life. Amen to that. Well said, my friend. Hey, Rockstar provides digital marketing software and services for your church to generate more interest, create more exposure, and reach more people. Let Hey, Rockstar amplify the awesomeness of your ministry. And, as always... Hey, Rockstar is a proud sponsor of the Stage Right with John Thorne podcast. Thank you for listening today. Thank you, Hey, Rockstar, for sponsoring. My special thanks to Mark Gershmill. Tune in next Friday at 12 noon for part two of my conversation with Gersh. Have a great week.